Okay, let's say a prayer as we, as we begin. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much uh, for the finished work of your son on the cross. We thank you that he is our great high priest, that he offered the one true sacrifice for sins. And now we can draw into your presence with confidence. So we do pray, Lord, that you would help us, um, even as we consider your word this evening, to persevere um, in, in following Jesus, help us to appreciate more of who he is and what he's done for us. And uh, we commit this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as I mentioned, we are going to be starting by looking at uh, the book of Hebrews. And it's a great book in the New Testament. I guess it's probably most famous for the uh, for the scary warning passages that is uh, that is in it. Um, the warnings that um, if we you know uh, don't persevere in following Jesus uh, to the end, what will uh, what will happen to us? I, I guess the the you know the overall message of Hebrews is something along these lines. It's not how you begin that matters, but it's how you finish. Who counts it's not how you begin that matters it's how you how you end um, that uh, that counts um, and so we're going to deal with the important issue of um, uh, falling away um, can Christians actually um, give up on following Jesus can Christians fall away or will they persevere um, to uh, to the end um, and you know one of those uh, one of those scary warning passages would be Hebrews chapter 10. And verses uh, 26 to uh, 31. Let me share that on the screen. And this is what uh, this is what the writer says. He says, "For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no no, long, no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will con consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses." How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who is trampled under foot? The Son of God has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. We know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so... Um, these are warnings that are written to Christians. They're written to a, a, a church. Um, and as we'll see, they've started to believe in Christ and they've started well, but they are in danger of um, of not finishing well, of, of giving up on following Jesus, on going back to Judaism. And so there's these these scary uh, warning passages. What will happen, actually, if you you give up on, on, on following Jesus? Um, Christ. Now, of course, Christians go to the book of Hebrews for different uh, theological positions, for you know, Calvinism and Arminianism and all that. Uh, I think Hebrews was one of Charles Wesley's, sorry, John Wesley's, uh, um, you know, proof texts or books uh, arguing for Arminianism. He, he rejected the Calvinist doctrine of perseverance of the saints, that God um, perseveres all who is elect. Um, uh, you know, once saved, always saved is a, you know, it's a rather crude summary of that. Uh, Wesley rejected that on the basis of the book of Hebrews and other places where because of these warning passages um, of, uh, you know, what will happen if, if, if a Christian falls, falls away. So we do need to, we, we will need to think carefully about um, the function of the warning passages um, as, as, as we go through. Um, the, the other interesting uh, thing about the book of Hebrews, of course, is the issue of authorship and of course, Hebrews is unique among all the books in the New Testament in that it is uh, formally anonymous with no explicit author stated. Actually, the, the Gospels is similar to that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are form formally anonymous as, um, as, as, as well. Um, but yeah, the book of Hebrews, it, uh, as it begins, there's, there's no address. There's no mention of the author. Um, it, it begins with a, a theological uh, statement. So if we uh, look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verses uh, 1 to 4. Uh, we read this. A long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom also he created the world. And, 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 and then on, on it goes. So there's, you know, it's not like uh, 
the rest of Paul's letters, say like 1 Thessalonians, where it says, you know, Paul to the church here, um, uh, grace and peace and, and so on. He just dives straight in, um, straight into the, uh, uh, to the, with a theological um, in, introduction about, you know, the place of Jesus and the purposes um, of, of, of God. Um, and, and therefore, because the book is formally anonymous, it, it's, any, any theory that we have about authorship will always be tentative. Um, we, we probably can't come to a definite answer uh, as to who wrote the book. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some clues that we can look at um, uh, to, to, to have a stab at it. Hebrews chapter 13, it ends like this. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with all of you, right? So it doesn't have any uh, formal, uh, you know, introduction, greetings, and so on. But it does have the final greetings, right? And uh, we learn here that he's closely associated with the apostles. He knows who Timothy is. He knows the leaders of of, um, of uh, the the church that he's writing to, or the Christians that he's writing to. Uh, you know, greet all your leaders and all the saints. He he has particular people in mind um, as he's as he's writing here. Um, so who who is it? Uh, there's been various uh, proposals that have been put forward. Uh, Paul, Hollis, Luke or Clement of Rome, uh, Barnabas, Priscilla and Aquila, um, and then many other suggestions as well. Silas, Epaphras, Philip, Mary, um, and, 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 and more. Let's have a look at each of these uh, in, in turn and then come to a conclusion. Um, so Paul, um, the earliest manuscript um, that we have, which is P46, Papyrus 46, uh, it places uh, Hebrews in the Pauline corpus. Um, this is also the view of the Eastern Church and the Alexandrian Church that is down near Egypt. <laughs> uh, there's a papyrus um, that gives the title to the book, The Letter of Paul to the Hebrews. Um, there is um, uh, Clement of Alexandria. I claimed that <coughs> that Paul had, uh, um, so I've got this uh, wrong, that Paul has written in Hebrew um, and then Luke translated it uh, into, into Greek. Um, Origen argued that it was maybe one of Paul's disciples who took Paul's materials and wrote it on his, um, uh, wrote it on his behalf. And then later on, Jerome and Augustine, who were in the Western church, they argued that Paul wrote Hebrews, and then from that point on, most um, most of church history, uh, people thought that Paul um, Paul wrote the letter. Um, against this, there's the Muratorian canon, uh, Irenaeus, and also uh, Hippolytus of Rome, Rome, who all agreed that Paul was not the author. Um, and as we said, it was this was changed by Jerome and Augustine later, and <coughs> and by 419 BC. The uh, Count Six Synod of Carthage. Um, it was uh, ascribed to Paul and and uh, and and thereafter. Right? But uh, these days, the last probably fifty years or so, um, no one has tried to defend Pauline authorship at all, despite the very strong tradition in the early church. And <laughs> there are various arguments is put forward against Pauline authorship. Um, the first one is that Paul normally identifies himself as the author in the letters. Every other letter we've looked at, he introduces himself. So it's strange that he doesn't do that here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 suggests that the author was not among the apostles. Um, the subject matter, uh, Jesus as the high priest and so on, um, is not found so strongly in Paul's other writings. And some of his other themes, which we've seen like justification, <coughs> Uh, and the cross and so on don't feature as strongly in the let in, in the book. The style's a bit different to Paul's other letters, and the Greek is very polished. Um, it's more like Luke and Acts, um, you know, uh, Luke's literary masterpieces, um, than 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 Paul's uh, Paul's other letters. Now, Paul's Greek is generally quite good, but <coughs> um, if you're familiar with uh, the Greek of the New Testament. Um, you know, Luke Acts is probably the best, and then you know Hebrews is, is is way up there. There's a reason why when you're learning Greek, you never study the book of Hebrews because it's, it's it's very very difficult. Um, so those are some of the arguments uh, against uh, Pauline authorship and why many people today don't hold that. Um, so what are the other alternatives then? 
uh, well, there was Paulus. This was uh, Luther's choice. Um, uh, he chose Apollos because we've, we've seen Apollos was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He vigorously refuted the Jews, according to Acts. Um, and that's very much what happens in this, this, this letter, you know, showing how um, Jesus comes to fulfill um, the, you know, the various things of the Old Testament to replace the Old Testament priests and sacrifices and, and, and so on. Uh, Apollos had some connection with Paul. Um, and this is the, you know, the choice for many uh, 20th century commentators. Um, Luke or Clement of Rome was Calvin's choice. Clement of Rome uh, was lived in 90 to 100 um, AD. Uh, but the connections between Luke and Hebrews are not very compelling. Uh, Clement is the first person to cite Hebrews um, in 1 Clement chapter 36. Uh, it's not impossible that he would quote his own work. Um, but overall, if you look at Clement's other writings, um, they seem to not so they seem to be utterly at variance um, with the arguments of, of, of Hebrews. So uh, he, if Clement was the author, then he would be contradicting himself. Uh, then there's Barnabas. Barnabas was suggested by Tertullian. Um, he's also uh, found some modern supporters uh, as, as well. Barnabas had a Levitical background. Um, and so that, uh, you know, that, that perhaps suggests um, a connection to the content of the letter. He was also a close partner of Paul, as we know, and went on his missionary journeys. Um, and his name means son of encouragement. We'll see in a moment that the letter is described as a word of exhortation. So that kind of fits with his name, but that's probably just a bit too neat rather than compelling um, evidence. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, this was suggested by Errol Panak in uh, the 19th century. Uh, and uh, Priscilla and Aquila, we first meet them in, in Corinth. They're Jewish refugees um, from, uh, from Rome. Um, they have some connection with Timothy uh, at Ephesus and Corinth. Um, and we're told they explain the way of God more adequately to, to Apollos. Um, so there's, there's some possibility that it was, it was them. Although the, in chapter 11, verse 32, um, the author uses a masculine singular pronoun to describe himself. So uh, you, you couldn't have a, um, at least Aquila couldn't be the, um, couldn't be the primary author because she is female. Um, so, um, yeah. But then there are the other suggestions and we've seen, as we've seen, some have said Silas, Ephraim, Philip, Mary, uh, and, 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 and so on. Um, Carson's uh, conclusion is probably the best one for us. It's far better to admit our ignorance, right? In other words, in the end, we just we just don't know. We don't know who um, who wrote um, the book of Hebrews. Right? It may have been Paul. Um, it may have been one of these other people um, who is a, is associated with the apostle or associated with Paul. But in the end, um, we cannot know with with any certainty who it. It was. Um, and that leads to another, uh, a second question, I guess, which is, well, if we don't know who wrote the book, then how can it be part of scripture, right? Now, this is not a doctrine lecture, so we don't need to go into too much detail here. Um, but some of the criteria for um, for books ending up in the New Testament was, I mean, that they're their, their authority was recognized from the beginning, and usually that's because they were so either written by an apostle um, or they were closely associated um, with, 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 with one of the apostles. So what about the book of, of Hebrews? Should Hebrews be in the canon? Um, does the fact that it's formally anonymous um, diminish its authority? Um, and the short answer is, is, is no, it doesn't diminish its authority. Um, because we, we must remember that the, what, what makes something the word of God is, is, is not that the church decides that it's the word of God. You know, that's not, that's not how it works. Um, what makes it the word of God is that it is the word of God. It's divinely inspired. And what the church does is recognize the authority, the divine authority of, of the book in, of, of God's word, not to give, uh, give the authority to it. 
And what we find is that uh, from the very beginning, the Eastern churches and the Alexandrian churches, they, um, they welcomed um, uh, Hebrews as, as part of the scriptures, um, probably because they thought it was written by Paul um, and therefore they accepted it. And we've seen that the West took much longer. It was really only um, when um, Jerome and Augustine um, argued for Pauline authorship, then it was more widely um, accepted there. Um, but from there, from there on, it, 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 it has been uh, regarded as, as uh, canonical, and, uh, and we should as well. I think uh, even though it's, we don't know who wrote it, it, it does still seem to fit the criteria of being um, associated with the apostolic band, right? Because he knows Timothy, um, we know travel with Paul and so on, and, and, and he certainly knows the other leaders of the church and so on. Okay, uh, you can ask more about that in your in your doctrine class. Okay, let's go on to audience then. Uh, who is this letter written to? Okay. And again, this is a very difficult question um, to answer because it's unlikely that the title of the book, um, you know, for the Hebrews or to the to the Hebrews, is as an original title um, of the book. It first appears in a papyrus in AD two hundred. Uh, and it's not used by earlier earlier writers. Um, in that particular manuscript, it's grouped with the Pauline epistles. Um, so they're you know they're named to the Romans, the Corinthians, and so on. Um, and it's probable probable that he just followed the same naming format and wrote uh, to to the Hebrews. And so the uh, it was clearly assumed that it was written to a group of Hebrew, that is Jewish um, Christians. Um, and that's the view of most, most scholars uh, today. But can we be more specific than that? Can we be more specific than to say that this was written to a group of Hebrew, you know, Hebrew that is Jewish, uh, Jewish Christians? Uh, in, um, in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, uh, you might remember there is a conflict between the uh, Jewish, uh, between the Hebrews, that is the Hebrew-speaking Jews, and the Hellenistic Jews, that is the, the Greek-speaking Jews, right? Um, so is that a distinction? Yeah? Is, it, is it the Hebrews, that is Jewish-speaking, uh, you know, Hebrew-speaking people as opposed to Greek-speaking people? That's unlikely uh, because, as we've said, Hebrews is written in very, very polished Greek, right? So presumably it's written to people who are quite fluent um, in uh, in Greek, Carson writes this. Uh, the most that can be reasonably said is that the Jewish background of the of the believers was probably not so much in the conservative rabbinic traditions of Palestine as in Hellenistic Judaism, uh, influenced by various nonconformist Jewish sects, of which the Essenes are but one um, example. If we go to the next slide, um, all in all, the letter was written for Greek-speaking Jewish Christians seems beyond doubt right? now as we as we read on we see that the the author he knows about the experience of his readers so it's not a it's not a general letter in the sense that he's just writing for for random people he's writing for a specific group of people a, a group that he knows personally so he says this in chapter 10 uh, he says recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated. You had compassion on those in prison. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Um, and so it sounds like he, he, he knows these people, right? And he knows their situation. He knows what they've been through um, and, and, and his He's writing to encourage these specific Christians, but where you know where, where are these Christians living? Right. Again, the short answer is we don't really know. Um, although we can put forward a couple of, of possibilities. One possibility is that they are living in Palestine, possibly in Jerusalem, or to the Hebrews. That's where most of them live. Um, but. Uh, the letter talks about the tabernacle, not the temple. It's written in polished Greek. Um, so it seems more likely that it's a Greek-speaking uh, 
audience. Nothing particularly favors Jerusalem. So others have possible, there are other <coughs> locations. One other example, possible location would be Rome, because the final greeting in chapter 13 says, uh, talks about those from, uh, from Italy send greetings um, that may suggest that they're writing back to, um, back to Rome. It may not mean that, uh, we'll see in a moment, but that's, that, that, that's one possibility. So it may be Jewish Christians residing in Rome, but as Carson says, it's in the end, it's it's just a guess. We can't we, we can't really know. Okay, let's go on to the provenance and dating. And uh, since we're not certain of the author and we're not certain of the audience, uh, we're probably not going to have much certainty of the dating as well, isn't it? Um, now he mentioned Hebrews thirteen twenty four just now. It says those from Italy send you their greetings, but that is a uh, it's it's unclear exactly what that statement means. There's two possible ways of reading that statement. Uh, it could mean that the audience were originally from Italy, uh, and 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 so they're sending um, greetings to Italy, <coughs> or it could mean that the author's in Italy, and he's sending the greetings to the recipients who are living in in another place. You see how it works. Those from Italy send you send you their greetings which direction is the greetings going who's in italy and who's not um it's it, it's impossible to know i don't think we can really um we can really make a decision on that right so provenance could be written in rome or audience could be living in rome uh, but not both um it, it's 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 one or it's the other so if we if we go on the assumption that it's not written by one of the apostles, um, then it couldn't be written too early. Um, AD, it's probably after AD 50. The fact that it's quoted by Clement, uh, which is dated at 96 AD, means it, it can't have been written after that. So somewhere between 50 and 96 AD. Um, and it also must be written in the lifetime of Timothy because he's mentioned in the letter um, he joined Paul's missionary journeys in 49 uh, a, a, AD. Um, some look at chapter 12 and verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of, of shedding your blood. Um, does this suggest that it's written uh, during or before um, the persecution by Nero, uh, which happens in 64 AD? Maybe. Uh, but again, um, it, it could be a generic statement. It's impossible um, to know. Um, the, the other thing we can think about is the, uh, it, his discussions of the tabernacle and the sacrifices and so on. They suggest that the temple is that they're still ongoing at the time of, 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 of writing. Um, it would be very strange because, because he's arguing that uh, you know Jesus is the high priest that replaces the Old Testament priest. Jesus' sacrifice is the perfect sacrifice that replaces the Old Testament sacrifices. It'd be very strange um, if to not mention the destruction of the temple if it had already happened. So for that reason, it's probably written before AD uh, 70, right? So here's Carson's conclusion. One cannot decisively rule out any date between AD 60 and 100, but most you know, the preponderance of evidence favors a date before 70 AD. Okay, so we're not sure of the author, we're not sure of the audience, we're not sure where it's written from or where it's written to. Uh, we're not very sure of the dating either. Um, so I hope this hasn't been fruitless, fruitless time for us to have the discussion about. But people are going to ask you about it, you know, who. Who wrote Hebrews and so on? Um, why is it in the New Testament canon? It's good to be aware, I guess, of, um, of, of, of these things. Okay, let's go to the next the next topic, which is one of, uh, of genre. Uh, how are we to think about the book of Hebrews? Now, again, there are, there's probably three different alternatives that are commonly put forward. The first is it's described as a theological treatise, um, something like Romans. Second is it's described as an epistle, but it's a letter written to a church. Um, and then the third is a word of exhortation. Let's have a look at each of these in, in turn. So some suggest it's a, it's a theological treatise, and 
perhaps it lends itself towards that because it's it is so impersonal the author doesn't introduce himself doesn't give any greetings at the beginning um it's certainly packed full of of, of, of theology and so on but the things that that don't fit with that is the warning passages which suggest a pastoral purpose he really wants to encourage his readers and it does end like an epistle there's no opening greetings but there are closing greetings so um those features don't fit very well for a theological treatise um an epistle remember an epistle is a letter that's written uh written to a church to be read um publicly uh, and it does have final greetings. It is written to a church, um, and so that justifies us calling it um, an epistle. Uh, but again, it, uh, its 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 structure, its formal structure, is uh, is a bit different, I guess, to some of the other epistles we see in the in the New Testament. So the third <coughs> category that uh, is suggested then is is a word of exhortation, and this is how. Uh, the book of Hebrews talks about <coughs> itself um, in chapter 13 and verse 22. Let me share the full verse on the screen. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 22. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Now, I like this verse, isn't it? Because uh, his idea of brief is 13 chapters uh, packed full of uh, theology. So I hope you will uh, bear with my brief class this evening uh, over the next few hours. Uh, because I mean, the reality is, isn't it? There's always much more to say, isn't it? And even though Hebrews says a lot, <coughs> there's, there's much more that would be said. But he describes it as a, you know, bear with my, <coughs> my word of exhortation. He's trying to exhort them, encourage them, <coughs> spur them on uh, in, uh, in following the Lord Jesus. And so some have suggested, actually, the book of Hebrews, it sounds a bit more like a sermon than a letter. Um, there are a couple of texts that have come up again and again in the book of Hebrews, like Psalm 110, um, Psalm 95, <coughs> we might add. Jeremiah 31, and a few others. Um, is it is it a uh, sermon that is kind of expounding on these particular uh, texts? Um, I think it's safe to say it is an epistle, but it's more like uh, it has more of a sermony um, approach to it, maybe. Okay, let's go on to the next topic, which is purpose. And uh, of all the issues we've talked about, this is really the this is really the key one, isn't it? What is the author's intention? Why is he writing this letter? What does he hope to achieve by it? Because we want to understand that. Because then, when we teach the letter, whether it's preaching or Bible study or whatever, we want the author's purpose to become our purpose as 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 we teach it. So we don't take it out of out of its its context. Um, so we've seen it's a it's a word of exhortation. It's something like a, a written sermon. We might call it a homily. Um, uh, and an exhortation uh, is a word that's often used um, when sermons are being preached. The author, ultimately, he wants to spur them on to keep following Jesus. We might summarize the purpose in this way. The purpose is to exhort the hearers to endure in the pursuit of the promised reward in obedience to the word of God, and especially on the basis of their new covenant relationship with the Son. To exhort the hearers to endure in the pursuit of the promised reward, in obedience to the word of God, and especially on the basis of their new covenant relationship um, with, with God. And, and this helps us to, to capture some of the features of the letter. Um, one of the things you, 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 we notice as we look at the book of Hebrews is it sets out the Christian life like a journey to the promised land. Right? Except in the book of Hebrews, the promised land is not, you, you know, the physical land of, of Israel, Palestine, right? But it's the, it's heaven. Um, so just as, you know, God's Old Testament people, they were rescued out of Egypt and they were brought to 
the promised land, but not all of them made it there. Some of them rebelled and perished in the wilderness. So it's it's making a contrast. Okay, but that's what the Christian life is like. Um, as the church, as a, as, a, as a new covenant people of God, we're also on a journey. Right? We're on a journey to our promised land. It's the promised land of heaven. Um, but we haven't made it yet, right? And there's a danger that we won't all make it there if we don't persevere in persevere in faith. Um, and so you, this uh, helps us to understand the opening chapters where it talks about Joshua and giving them rest, and you know it's focused on entering the land. You also see it in chapter um, chapter 11, for example, with Abraham, who's looking forward to um, a promised city, a, 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 a rest, a place of rest, and so on. Um, and so God redeemed his people out of Egypt. He made them his, his people. He entered into a covenant relationship with them, a covenant relationship that was preserved by priests who offered sacrifices, and he was bringing them on a journey to the promised land. That's the Old Testament. Right? And the, the author seems to transpose that um, into a new covenant relationship. Where now God's people is, is is those who believe in Christ, those who have been redeemed from um, not from Egypt but from sin and death, right? Um, and we've entered into a new covenant relationship with God through Jesus, our great High Priest, who offers the perfect once for all sacrifice for sin, and He's therefore um, secured for us a place in in in, in heaven, right? in the in you know the the ultimate presence of God, the literal presence of God, um, but we haven't arrived yet, so we need to keep persevering, make sure we reach that goal and not not fall into disbelief, disobedience, like Israel um, did in the wilderness when they refused to enter the promised land because they refused to continue in, 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 in faith. So, uh, yeah, you, you can see in in, in how the letter works then it has this kind of overall um shape to it and that's why the the message is the big message is endure um, because we haven't arrived at our destination yet jesus has secured it but we must endure we must persevere um and the sign that we are truly one of god's people is that we do persevere to the end. Okay, let's continue on. And try and uh, just draw that out a little bit more. Uh, so uh, we've seen that the that there is this title that suggests that it's written to the Hebrews or for the Hebrews. Um, even though that was is added later, it does very much seem like the letter is written to those who have a background in in Judaism. Um, and it seems to be what's what's happening is that they are they're Jewish Christians, right, who've converted to Christ out out of Judaism, uh, and now that they are facing persecution, there is the temptation to leave Christ and to go back to Judaism because you you, you might know in the in, in the Roman Empire at the time Judaism was kind of accepted as a you know, as one of the religions of the empire, but Christianity, as it uh, as it as it uh, diverged from Judaism, it was it, it was not under that protection. It was, and, and so it, there was a great persecution that could result if you were a Christian, especially after after Nero, right? Um, and so it seems like the Christians, these Jewish these Jewish believers, they have they've suffered um, as a result of believing in Jesus, and therefore the temptation is to go back to, to Judaism. So we saw this earlier, um, chapter 10, verse 32. Recall the former days when after you were enlightened, that is when you became uh, believers, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partnered partners with those so treated. You had compassion on those in prison. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had better possessions and an abiding one that is heaven. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. You have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, 
you may receive what is promised. Now, as you see here, it's talking about their persecution in the past, but it does come across as rather severe, isn't it? Um, imprisonment, um, confiscation of property, um, uh, violence, and so on. And, and he's saying, look, you, you started well. You know, you started well as you, as you suffered for Jesus, as you look forward to heaven. And that's what you need to do now. You need to continue to endure, right? Keep your eyes on the reward, the heavenly reward, and, and, and keep on um, uh, persevering. Right? Uh, so the fact that uh, they're being tempted to go back to mainstream uh, Judaism is also somewhat suggested in chapter 13 as well. Let's read from verse 7. It says this, remember your leaders. Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider their, the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. It is good for the heart <coughs> to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. <coughs> but we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. The bodies of those animals whose blood is brought out, um, is brought into holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin, are burned outside the camp. <coughs> so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp <coughs> and bear the reproach he endured. So you can see here he's 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 drawing a very strong um, contrast <coughs> between Judaism and 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 and, and Christianity, and <coughs> essentially he's saying that uh, you know the teachings of Judaism are, are not going to not going to bring you into heaven, and that's why you need to. Um, persevere, and you need to um, stick with Jesus uh, to uh, to the end. Right? So uh, one of the things that one of the phrases that's repeated throughout the letter is the idea of maintaining their confession. Uh, they're being told to to not fall away, um, and the way that he's going to encourage them to do this is basically by showing them that Jesus is is better. Jesus is better than um, than Judaism. Uh, he wants them to have a, a fresher, a bigger picture of who Jesus is, of what he's done for, for us, so that we won't be tempted to go back. Right? He says he's better than the angels. He is better than Moses. He's a better priest. He offers better sacrifices. He brings a better covenant, a new covenant, which is built on better promises. He brings a better salvation, a greater salvation, um, an eternal salvation, <coughs> and so on. So by showing how Jesus is, is, is better, um, then we won't be tempted to go back, um, to fall away from Jesus, even if that um, even if it means that we will have to suffer for following for following Jesus. Okay, why don't I pause? I'll take a drink. Um, do you want to ask any questions so far? Okay, let's talk about structure. Now, most people recognize that the book of Hebrews is a literary masterpiece. Right? Um, it's 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 very carefully constructed it has a complex um structure in many ways uh but yeah and so that, that that's widely recognized but there's great disagreement over uh the major and the minor breaks in the argument and, and as in what is the best way to to structure it let's have a look at a couple of the the main approaches um so the first one is kind of a conceptual or thematic structure and this is where you basically you um, structure the book around the prominent themes and ff ff bruce uh, is an example of that um, so you can see the topics 
the finality of Christianity, the true home of the people of God, the high priesthood of Christ, the order of Melchizedek, covenant, sanctuary, and sacrifice, call to worship, faith, and perseverance, including, including exhortation and prayer, uh, all script. Uh, so it's basically summarized around the themes. Right? Um, and a structure like this, I guess it gives a pretty good summary of the contents of the book, right? uh, but not necessarily of the flow of the argument. Right? So the next type of structure you'll find is what we might call rhetorical structure. Um, and this is where the, they try and structure the book using rhetorical devices. So you look for inclusions, you look for rhetorical questions, direct address, repetitions, um, these types of things. You, you also will try and compare the book to um, ancient rhetorical handbooks. Because remember, uh, the book is a word of exhortation. The, the, the author is trying to persuade his audience to keep following Jesus, right? And uh, and so it, he's by trying to persuade someone, well, that's what rhetoric is about. And rhetoric is about speaking in a way that is persuasive that will convince your your your, your audience. You might remember we've seen the different types of uh, of, of rhetoric: judicial, deliberative, epideictic, um, and so on. And so people have tried to structure the book around one of these. Um, rhetorical styles right? um, but it does basically it doesn't quite um, it doesn't quite fit right it's not it's not easily categorized according to Greek rhetoric because it seems to integrate aspects of both the deliberative and epideictic um, uh, rhetoric I'll explain more of that in a moment so you've got thematic structure FF Bruce you've got rhetorical structures then you, there are those that look at uh, literary analysis, right? So, um, so here uh, you, uh, yeah, you, 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 basically you're looking at the the literature itself. What's the style? What's the genre? What things are repeated? What vocab vocabulary vocabulary summaries? Um, these these types of things, and they notice. Okay, there's announcements of subjects. There's there's bookends. There's alternation between exposition and exhortation. There's repetition of terms. There's hook words to transition from one part of the argument to the next. Um, it's quite symmetrical in its arrangement um, and, 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 and so on. Um, it's probably not a chiastic structure. Um, it seems to move in a more linear way to a climax, but some people have, have, have attempted that. Now, what do I... Uh, one of the observations that's very helpful here is the way that it it goes between exposition and exhortation. So basically, um, we see this all the way through the book. Right? He will say, Jesus is better in this way. Right? He's better than the angels. And then a warning. Therefore, don't fall away from Jesus. Or don't stop listening to Jesus. Okay, then he's better than Moses. Here's why it's better than Moses, long argument. Okay, then the warning. Therefore, don't fall away. Then he's a great high priest, better than a Levitical priest. Therefore, don't fall away. And he keeps on moving between exposition. This is why Jesus is better. This is why Jesus is superior. And then um, exhortation. Therefore, stick with Jesus. Persevere. Endure. Don't fall away. He keeps moving between these uh, these two two aspects um, so let's have a let's have a look at the text itself and just look at a couple of examples of this and we'll start with hebrews chapter one okay so uh you know the first major section one to four is kind of like a prologue i guess to the to the letter and then um he's he's He's, he begins to argue that Jesus is superior to angels. Okay? Um, and then there are various quotes about what God's word says about angels and what God's word says about um, the Christ. Um, and, and then he, he moves from that exposition to talking about the, um, the, to the exhortation, to the, to, to, to the warning, right? Um, so he says in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, 
we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how should we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness to signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Right, so we have exposition, um, Jesus superior than the angels, and then the, um, the, the, the exhortation. And we, we see more. So let's have a look at another example. Say chapter 5, verse uh, verse 1, right? The argument here is that Jesus is a, is a, is a high priest um, who has, uh, he's, a superior, he's a superior high priest, a high priest who is in the order of Melchizedek, right? Um, and then we move to the exhortation, right? About this, we have much to, to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. But though you, by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic uh, principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. And then verse 1, therefore let us leave the elementary doctrines and go on to maturity, uh, etc. Et and then verse 4, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and shared in the Holy Spirit and tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and fallen away, to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up uh, to, uh, to contempt, right? So, uh, and then, but, but then we're going to pick up the argument again uh, with, with, with ex uh, exposition. You know, he's, he's, the, he's the great high priest to, in the order of, uh, of, of, of Melchizedek, right? Uh, and... This will eventually lead to a, uh, a summary in chapter 10, verses 19 to 25, summarizing the argument, um, and then another um, warning passage, um, another, um, yeah, an, an, another uh, exhortation, right? If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins and so on. We read it at the start of, of the lecture tonight. So. This is what people observe, right? He keeps moving between um, exposition and exhortation. You know? This is why Jesus is superior. Therefore, um, don't, don't give up on Jesus. So this doesn't come through in the thematic structure like what F.F. Bruce does, because this isn't just rooted under, under topics. It, you don't see the type of argument that is, um, that, that is being made. Okay, then uh, the other thing that people try to do is they try to look at what is called discourse analysis. Back to the slides. Yeah. So discourse analysis. Um, and, and this tries to look at um, the, the uh, relationship between the various sections um, of, of, of the discourse, right? So, so Guthrie is a good example of this. He's looking for um, uh, transitional, uh, transitional elements. Um, he tries to categorize as exposition or exhortation. Um, and he, he looks at these two independently. So he says, okay, the, expos the exposition is, is kind of progressing in a logical fashion, and the exhortation is also progressing um, in, 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 a, in a logical fashion. Uh, fashion as, as as well. He notices the use of of, of let us these words to to structure uh, to structure the to structure the epistle uh, as well. And so he comes up with these exposition sections: son superior to the angels, purpose of the incarnation, superiority of his priesthood, superiority superiority of his um, of his offerings. And then um, we also have the uh, exhortation sections, right? Um, yeah, this is where you have positive examples, negative examples, the warnings, encouragement, word, encouraging words. Um, and he keeps on talking about the need for faithful endurance um, to reach the eternal rest. And he warns for those who refuse of the expectation of, 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 of judgment. So 
uh, you know, putting all those things together, this is the kind of structure that structure that uh, uh, all three will come up with. Um, so you can see we have kind of prologue in verses one to four. Um, then we have um, a couple of main sections, one to four, uh, basically four to ten, ten to thirteen, and the conclusion. And for each of these, you see there is an exposition, and then there is a exhortation. Um, and the other thing that this this points out is uh, that the main body of the letter is from four fourteen to ten twenty five. Four fourteen to ten uh, twenty five, and these these two parts four fourteen to sixteen here, uh, and then uh, ten nineteen to twenty five uh, are, are recognized as major turning points um, uh, in 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 the letter. Uh, so I think this is this is this is this is very helpful. Let's we'll look at the, at the text itself and see if we can follow this. So, uh, so just before, uh, you know, in the lead up to, to chapter 4, verse 14, this is where he's been talking about um, Joshua giving them rest in the wilderness, and there still remains a rest um, for, uh, for God's people and so on, and, and, and the rest of heaven. Um, and then we have a transition in the argument, chapter verses 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. We do have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, one tempted uh, by one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And it's kind of like a, a summary of the main section of the letter. We have a high priest. We have a high priest, Jesus, who didn't sin and then because through him, now we can have confidence or we can have assurance to approach God. Um, and so we're encouraged to do so. Notice the use of the, the, the uh, words here, let us. This is a fortitude subjunctive. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of, of grace. And then the main argument begins, chapter 5, verse 1. And so it's a longish argument. It goes all the way to the end of chapter uh, chapter 10. And basically the argument is Jesus is the great high priest, better than the Levitical priest, and Jesus' sacrifice is greater sacrifice than the sacrifices of the old, <coughs> old covenant, right? And having completed that argument, then he gives the summary. And you'll notice that there's some similarity between 4, 14, 16, and 10, 19, 20 to 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, since we have a great priest over the house of God, what should we do? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And, and so this, this then marks out the main kind of body or heart of the letter. At the heart of the letter is chapters 5 to, to 10. Right? Jesus, the high priest offering the perfect sacrifice. Yes, there are other things before that. Jesus greater than Moses, Jesus greater than the angels, and so on. Yes, there are things after that as well, um, you know, especially in terms of application in the final chapters. But that's the theological part of it. Um, and, 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 and this is where the kind of discourse analysis is very, very helpful. We don't just have it broken into topics, but we see the, the thrust of the argument. You see, we see the the heart of it. What's what's the what's the main point that he's trying to make, and therefore, what's the application? And if we were to summarize it, it would be it'd be something like this: What's the main argument? Well, Jesus is superior. 
his and his superior, especially as the great high priest who's offered the perfect sacrifice. So what's the application? Well, positively, the application is draw near with confidence. Right? In other words, <coughs> um, be assured, you know, be assured of your forgiveness. Be assured of your relationship with God. Draw near to him. You can enter God's presence without any fear because all of your sins have been paid for once and for all. That's the positive. But then, of course, there's the negative side of that, isn't it? Because if it's Jesus and his priesthood and his sacrifice, which means we can draw near to God, then if you are giving up on Jesus, well, you have no assurance. You have no forgiveness. You have no hope of eternal life. And hence the warning passages right, of the judgment, the destruction um, that will come if you give up, if you give up on Jesus. That's, that's, that's basically how the letter works in a, in a nutshell. Let's look at one other example. Um, this is West, of, uh, it's West, West Hall. I don't think it's West Hall. West Hall, I think it's correct. Um, but he's got three main sections, one to four. Consider Jesus the apostle of our confession. Four to ten. Uh, again, it's the same this is the same uh, central kind of theological part as as uh, as the previous one, two or three. Consider Jesus the high priest of our confession. And then uh, 10 to 13, we are partners in Jesus' heavenly calling and then broken it down further from that. So again, I think it's a, it's a very helpful, uh, helpful structure. If you like diagrams or pictures, um, here's another way of doing it. This is from... Uh, on the visual unit, uh, you can see here one, one to four in the same way, um, and then and Jesus is God's son. Four fourteen to ten eighteen, uh, Jesus is our great high priest, okay? um, and then drawing out the other parts as well in terms of the warnings and 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 the encouragements. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, any any questions you want to ask there? Okay, let's let's take a break at this point, and uh, let's take maybe five minutes break, and then we'll come back. Okay, so we're going to look at, uh, for our exegetical passage, we'll look at Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. It says this, now the point in what we are saying is this, we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not men. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it is necessary for the priest or for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since these are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault when, with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write them on their hearts. 
and I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Okay, let's go to our groups and discuss it together. Okay, welcome back. I think this is uh, this passage is a very good example of how the book of Hebrews uh, works, how the argument uh, works. Uh, let's just observe a couple of things um, uh, from, from this passage we've just looked at together. Um, Firstly, notice the, uh, the, the language of, of, uh, of Jesus being better. Right? It comes out a, a few times here, isn't it? Um, especially in verse 6. Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old. So he's got a better ministry. Um, his ministry is as the, as, the, as the covenant he mediates is better. Right? So he's got a better ministry. Um, that is based on a a better covenant, right? Um, which is enacted on better promises, right? Better ministry, better covenant, better promises, and, and so you see the argument, right? Jesus is better, so don't 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 go back, um, don't go back to the old priests, the old sacrifices, the old covenant. Um, in fact, he 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 goes. Uh, he puts it quite strongly in verse 13, isn't it? In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. What is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Right? Uh, obsolete means um, it's it, you don't use it anymore. I mean, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when we used to use cassette tapes and we used to use um, VHS uh, video, video tapes. And then, uh, you know, we used to walk around with our Walkmans and uh, you know, then they were replaced by compact disc CDs, and we had discmans, these uh, mini uh, CD players. Actually, there's a there's a museum in, in uh, Penang uh, that we often take people to, and in the museum they have all these items. Is there? You know, cassettes, videos, discmans, and then you then you realise you're old when all the things that you used when you were growing up is now in a now in a, in a museum. They're obsolete. People don't use cassette tapes anymore, right? Um, we don't even use CDs anymore. I mean, we're all probably using computers to sign in here. Do, do any of our computers have a CD drive in it anymore? Does the car you drive have a CD player in it anymore? Probably not. It's all USB, Bluetooth, whatever. It's obsolete. The new technology makes it, um, it's no longer needed um, anymore. Does anyone carry an iPod around anymore? You know, is it to play music on? No, of course. You, it's, what a waste of time when you have your phone, right? Your phone can do all these things for you, obsolete. So he's saying, look, this is like the old covenant. The old covenant is obsolete. It's old technology, if you like. It's been replaced. Um, although he's very careful in the argument, isn't it? He? He's not saying that the problem was with the old covenant itself. Uh, the, the problem is with the people under the old covenant, right? He's, he finds fault with them, right, because the old covenant, of course, it required obedience, obey and you are blessed, disobey and you are cursed, and they couldn't obey. So the problem was with, uh, with, was with them, right, because they didn't continue in, um, in the covenant. They were stubborn and rebellious. That's why there needed to be a better, a better covenant, right, a, a one that was based on unconditional um, uh, uh, forgiveness, right, that was not based on works, but was based on the finished work of Jesus um, instead. Um, the next thing to notice here is uh, he's teaching us how to read the Old Testament. Um, look at the, the kind of terms he uses here. Uh, he says that Jesus is a minister in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. Remember the Old Test, the Old Covenant had a tent, right? The tent was the tabernacle. But he's saying that Jesus ministers in the true tent, right? Now he's talking about heaven, right? Um, but he's by putting it in this way, talking about heaven as the true tent, right? He's saying that the that the tabernacle 
was a model or a picture that was pointing forward to a great reality, right? which was which was which was heaven, right? Um, or he talks about the priests, right? And uh, they they had to offer you know offer sacrifices and so on. Um, and he says that they, verse five, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Um, remember, uh, uh, if there's a copy, that that means there's an original, right? That which has been copied, right? If it's a shadow, right? Um, then th there has to be an object that's casting the shadow. Right? The shadow is pointing to the source of the shadow, which is the object. Right? You see, um, and then in verse, uh, he, he he draws from the Old Testament uh, where Moses is instructed when he builds the tabernacle, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you. Uh, on the mountain, right? and so all the way through the what this language is saying is that when God set up the old covenant, it wasn't a random thing, right? But it was meant to be a model or a picture or a shadow that is pointing forward to the ultimate reality, right? It's like when you, you know, when they build condominiums, right? Before they build the actual condominium, they, you know, they'll make a miniature model of it. Um, they'll set it up in the shopping mall somewhere. And, and 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 then they'll invite you to you know to, to to buy your unit even before they've built the real thing. It's a it's a model, it's a copy, it's a picture. It's not the real thing. You you, you know like when you're buying a, uh, an apartment in a condominium, you're not you know you're not buying a little piece of the of the model. You, you know no. And once they built the real thing. And once they built the actual condominium, you don't need the model anymore. You can toss the model away. It's obsolete. It's useless. Why, why look at the model when you can go to the actual property? And um, sorry, not my computer. Why, why, why look at the uh, why look at the model when you can look at the the actual condominium, right? Um, in 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 real life, yeah. He's saying, look, that's what the old covenant, the Old Testament, and the New is in the new covenant. The old testament is a, is a picture. It's all it's all one big model or shadow that's helping you to understand the reality that Jesus is going to bring. But Jesus has brought the brought the reality, and therefore now that Jesus has come, or now that the you know the condominium has been built, then how stupid to go back and say no, I don't want to. I don't actually want to live in the actual condominium. I I, I just want to have the plastic model. I mean that's just stupid, you know. That that that's just useless. That's worthless. Okay, the model is good when you don't have the real thing, but now that the real thing has come, why go back to the model? Right? This is the argument of of Hebrews. Um, but you can see how this is very helpful for us because it helps us to read the Old Testament properly. Right? Um, we are. It, it's the it's the idea of biblical theology or the idea of typology, right? And that is. Things in the Old Testament are pictures that are pointing forward to something else. So the priests point forward to a, a greater, greater priest, Jesus. The sacrifices point forward to a greater sacrifice, which is Jesus' sacrifice. Um, the tabernacle points forward to a greater pres you know, place where God dwells, which is, which, which is heaven itself. And, 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 and so on. The old covenant is pointing forward to a, you, you know, a better covenant, or a, a, new, a new covenant, and so on. So you, you have all of these. Um, Things in the Old Testament that is ultimately pointing forward to Jesus. So, um, so, the, so of course, this is not a, this is not an Old Testament course. But if we, we were studying the Old Testament, we would always want to see how does it keep pointing us forward to, to to Jesus? Because the writer to the Hebrews is teaching us how to read the Bible properly, um, to read it in a Christ-centered, a gospel, a gospel-centered way. So Jesus is better, and the Old Testament is a um, it's a type, it's a model, it's a pattern that's pointing forward to a greater fulfillment. So you'll see it all the way through uh, Hebrews, the idea of a true something. Okay? True means it's the ultimate, um, you know, the, the reality that the, that the model is pointing forward to. Okay, I think we're, we're almost out of time. Let's just do a brief tour of Hebrews and then uh, we will uh, we'll have to move over to the book of James. So let's go back to chapter one. Let's just try and trace out the main, you know, the main arguments. So I've got kind of a big picture of, of, of the letter, and then we'll we'll have to wrap up. Okay, so we've got the got the introduction. 
long ago and many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. He's appointed the heir of all things through whom he also created the world. And so what we see here is that Jesus is God's um, full and final revelation. Right? Here's the... Uh, in the past, God spoke partially in, in different ways, but now he's given us his full revelation through his, through his son. Uh, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact imprint of his nature. So he perfectly reveals God, um, and he, he has perfectly achieved God's work. Um, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The idea is that when you are working, right, you are standing up, right? And when you finished your work, you sit down to so the priest, you know, used to stand to offer all the sacrifices when they were done. At the end of the day, then they would sit down. But here it says Jesus is, is, is finished. He doesn't need to stand anymore because his work on the cross is, is, is complete. So here's the final word because he's a full revelation and he has a finished work, right? which is why we don't need additional writings, you know, additional books after the Bible, right? That would imply that Jesus' revelation is incomplete or that his work was incomplete. But since they're both full and, full and final, therefore there's, God has no additional words to say. All right, then uh, Jesus superior uh, to the angels, and there's a whole bunch of Old Testament quotations here. The point of the quotations is basically that angels are servants, um, but Jesus is the son. Um, who is served, right? Um, and therefore, we must listen to him um, because in the Old Testament, um, angels delivered the Old Covenant and uh, breaking the Old Covenant was punishable by death. So how much, so if Jesus is superior to the angels and he's delivered the gospel, how much worse it is to ignore the gospel compared to ignoring the law, right? Okay, then uh, we, we move to the, to the next part of, the next part here and and we see that jesus is the uh one to whom the creation is subjected and it's a reflection on psalm 8 and uh, jesus is the is, is presented to us as the perfect man you know, the perfect adam human beings were created in the image of god to rule over creation uh, but we failed to do it but now we see jesus um, who um has who is the perfect man um, who, who who has been exalted to rule um, over over the creation, um, and it's important that we emphasize his humanity because he, um, in order to be a priest and represent us, he has to be fully human. Remember, a priest is a go-between between human beings and God. Right? Um, they are mediator. They are the middleman. Right? So, in order to mediate, Jesus has to be fully man, and he also has to be fully God. He's emphasized his full divinity in chapter one. Now he's emphasizing that he's also the perfect man who's able to stand in our, um, our place. Um, and he says he's, Jesus is greater than Moses. Right? He says that, uh, uh, he says in verse 1, Holy brothers who share in a, in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. <laughs> and then it says, Moses was faithful as a servant. Christ is faithful as a son. Uh, and so it puts Moses on the level with the angels. And again, it, it exalts Jesus as the one who is being served. Right? Then we move on to the, the Sabbath rest. And um, this is uh, the more exhortation section. You can see today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. This is a quote here from Psalm 95, right? And, of course, some, uh, the, the events being described here is where Israel um, refused to enter the promised land in the book of Numbers, um, and therefore they couldn't enter the promised land. Um, they didn't enter into God's rest. They didn't enter into God's promised, uh, promised land. But now he, he takes that same scripture, um, and and applies it to to the Christians, you see, um, because what you know the journey that 
the um, that the Jews were having to the promised land is like the journey that the church, God's house, God's people, is 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 having to the real, the ultimate promised land which is which is heaven itself and so he says don't be like them learn from their lesson take care lest there be in any of you an unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living god so this is one of the one of the warning warning passages okay uh, then we get to the the main um, the main body and we've seen how it's framed with chapter 4 and verse 14 to 16 saying look he is our high priest he's he, he's, he's he can truly sympathize with us so let's draw near to God. Um, and then the main body, chapters 5 to 10, explains how he is that great high priest. He's offered the perfect <coughs> uh, sacrifice uh, for, uh, for, for sins. So it shows that he's, he's qualified. You can't make yourself a priest. You have to be chosen to be a priest. And Jesus is chosen to be a priest um, with these quotations from Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. Um, and therefore... Um, and the warning passage, right? Um, don't, 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 don't stop listening. You know, find out, find out more. We need to, you know, we've only just done the basics. We need to go on, um, go on deeper because if, uh, uh, because it's impossible if you turn your back on God's revelation to uh, to again um, repent. So it's another one of the warning passages. Okay, so how is Jesus priesthood greater? Well. Jesus is a priest of a different order. He's of the order of Melchizedek. And remember, Melchizedek is that uh, strange cre strange figure that we meet in Genesis chapter 14. He also appears again in Psalm 10. Um, and then here in, in Hebrews, and he's not mentioned anywhere else in the, in, in the Bible. Um, and he's a king, What's and he's a priest. And uh, he's the king of righteousness. That's the meaning of his of his name you see here and he's also the king of salem salem shalom means uh, peace so he's also the king of of peace and the interesting thing about him is he just appears um and and then he disappears as so it's like he's got no beginning or or end it's like an eternal kind of eternal right um, and so he's saying, look, Jesus is a priest like that. Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek. He's not like the Levitical priest. He's a priest like Melchizedek. He's a priest of a greater order. He's a kingly priest. And you, you know, the, the, the Levitical priests, they couldn't be priests, right? Because the priests had to be from Levi, from Aaron's line. Right? But the kings came from the line of Judah, right? So how can Jesus be both a king and a priest? If because Jesus is born of the line of Judah, right? Uh, through David, right? So if Jesus is from the line of David, then how can he be a priest? Well, he can't be a Levitical priest because the Levitical priest came from Levi, which is a different tribe to Judah, right? And so how is Jesus a priest? Well, he's not a he's not a priest in the order of the the Levitical priest. He has a better priesthood, right? A priesthood that precedes the Levitical priests. Because the Levitical priests, we only get them in Leviticus and Exodus and so on, right? But Melchizedek, we meet him in Genesis, right? He's a superior priest. He's a king priest, a kingly priest, an eternal kingly priest, a righteous kingly priest who brings peace. Right? This is the kind of priest that that Jesus is. This is the argument. Um, and, and then he says, look, Abraham gave a tithe to, you know, Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek it's from Abraham that, you know, the Levitical priests would come. So, uh, you know, the, the inferior gives to the superior, right? So, therefore, Melchizedek must be superior to the Levitical priests. That's the argument, right? Okay. Um, then uh, we're, we're told that um, he's, he's made a priest by an oath, uh, and, and it's that he will be a priest forever. Remember, the, the problem with the Levitical priests, the reason why there were so many is that they kept dying. But Jesus is a priest forever because he conquered death, never to die again. So his priesthood is greater. If he, Jesus has an eternal priesthood, he will never be replaced because he always, he always lives to intercede, um, uh, always lives to make intercession for us. Right? Um, then the passage we've just looked at, um, he's a, he has a better ministry based on a better covenant, which is the new covenant, Jeremiah 31. 
which is enacted based on better promises, promise of forgiveness. Then chapter 9, verses, uh, verses uh, uh, 1 to 10, um, we have the... Um, we have a description of what the old covenant was like and how they would go into the to the holy place. Um, but here it would only deal with outward sins, right? And it's that we're told here um, it was to it was for the cleansing of the of, of the flesh, right? It says, according to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshipper. They deal only with food and drink and various washings. Right? Um, in other words, the old covenant, it brought a symbolic washing. It was outward. It was a washing of the flesh. It didn't actually wash away. It didn't actually cleanse the heart, the conscience, um, the, the inside. But Jesus' sacrifice does, right? Um, Jesus offers a... Um, he, he, uh, a, a better sacrifice, right? Um, not blood and, of bulls and goats, but his own blood. And his blood is doesn't just um, purify the flesh or the outside. His is able to purify our conscience. He's able to give us real forgiveness in our uh, in, in in our hearts, right? So it's a perfect sacrifice once for all. Um, full, complete, perfect, and sufficient um, sacrifice uh, for, uh, for sins. And this kind of once for all is then emphasized um, in, uh, in, in, in chapter 10. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, he says here in verse uh, 11, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ offered us for all time a single sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of God. His sacrifice is full and complete and final, and that's why he sits sits down. Um, and, and, and this brings us the assurance, right? Now we can draw near to God with assurance. But if we don't continue trusting in Jesus, then um, then punishment so the final part of the letter then is is encouraging us to press on in faith. And chapter 11 is kind of like, like the hall of faith. Um, you know, all the heroes of faith in the Old Testament, um, all climaxing in chapter 12 with Jesus, um, the, the, the uh, pioneer um, of uh, the, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, the pioneer of our faith. Um, Jesus, who who endured suffering on the way to glory, he's held up as the model for us. We too are to endure suffering on the way um, to glory. We need to endure discipline, endure suffering now, because we're looking forward to a heavenly home um, that will be uh, that will be worth it um, uh, in the end. Um, and the final chapters then deal with what uh, what uh, acceptable um, reverent worship through Christ looks like. And it's we no longer worship God through the sacrificial system and all those things, but now we're told what what true acceptable worship looks like, and it's it's hospitality, um, and it's um, uh, keeping the marriage bed pure, and it's visiting people in, uh, in prison, and it's a sacrifice of praise that is the lips that acknowledge His name, and it's a, and it's obeying our leaders, and all these. This is what. Um, true acceptable worship looks like um, under the new covenant as opposed to all the rituals of the of, of old covenant um, okay so there, there, there's a there's a very very brief overview of, of Hebrews let's just uh, look at the, the themes and then we'll, we'll, we'll move over to James uh, Reverend can you explain uh, chapter 8 verse 4 and 11 uh, chapter 8, verses 4 and 11. Sure. Let me just put on the screen. Oh, chapter 8, verse 4. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. Right. So verse 4 is saying that Jesus is... Um, what this is saying is that Jesus is a priest in heaven, not a priest on earth. Right? That's what it means. He went into the true tent that is, is, is set up. It's a heavenly 
it's a, he's he, yeah he's a minister in, in heaven he's at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven so jesus is a priest in heaven he's not a priest on earth he, he he's not qualified to be a priest on earth why because the earthly priests were the levitical priests right and jesus is not of the tribe of, of levi he's not that type of priest he's a is a heavenly is a heavenly priest in the order of Melchizedek. So that's the meaning. Um, that's the meaning here. Um, and then verse eleven, uh, they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each his brother, saying, "No," for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And this is this is trying to say how the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. Remember, in the old covenant, it is mediated um, through um, you know through the leaders, right? So. Um, especially through Moses. So Moses would go up on the mountain and get, um, you know, God would speak to Moses and then Moses would come down and say, look, this is what, this is what God says, right? So you could know God, but it was, it, it was mediated. You needed to, to receive it through someone else, right? But he's saying in the new covenant, it's not like that. Um, we have a personal, we have a personal direct relationship with God through, through Jesus. We will all know him from the least of him. Than to the greatest. So as you know Jesus through the gospel, um, you, you can you can know God you can know God directly without the need for earthly mediators. That's the meaning of the verse. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? But then, uh, but then, how come you still usually say that uh, in other parts of the book it says that? Jesus is the priest. And verse 4, it says Jesus is the heavenly priest. Well, he is a priest, right? Because he's not a Levitical priest, right? He's not a priest oh, in the line okay. of Aaron. Okay, I understand, I understand. He's, okay. a, he's, a, he's a priest of a different order, which is the priest in the order of Melchizedek. He can't be in the line of uh, an, an uh, Aaronic priest because he's not. From the tribe of Levi, he's from the tribe of Judah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, maybe I'll leave you to read the themes. So, the themes priesthood that's obviously a big one, Jesus once for all sacrifice. Um, I mean, one of the implications of it, this is that we, uh, it says, look, we're not, we're not under the old covenant anymore. Right? There are certain churches which base their worship off the old covenant, isn't it? And so they would call, you know, the church, the house of God, they'll have a sanctuary at the front, they'll call the leaders priests um, who will wear special robes, they'll make sacrifices. Um, you know, the, the best example of this is from Catholicism, of course. You know, they have an altar where they offer sacrifices and so on. Um, and they're trying to replicate old covenant religion. And it's wrong. Right? It's wrong because we're not under the old covenant. Anymore. We're under the new covenant. But sometimes you see certain Protestant churches doing similar things or at least using similar language as well. The old covenant is obsolete. Right? We're under the new covenant, which changes the way that we worship God. We must be very clear on this. Yeah. Uh, so it's once for all sacrifice the new covenant, full assurance. I think this is one of the interesting things, right? On the one hand, you have some of the scariest warning passages, and you have um, these pleas to full assurance of faith, right? The idea is um, Jesus' finished work gives you full assurance. Because you don't have to earn your salvation. Jesus has done it all. So therefore, you, as you trust in Jesus, you can have full assurance of your salvation. Right? But then there are the warning passages, right? Because um, if G Jesus gives you the full salvation, you can only be saved if you hold fast to him. Therefore, if you depart from him, you, you cannot have salvation. So how do we understand the warning passages? Well, the, the Arminian will just say, well, ultimately it's up to your choice, not God's choice. You chose to follow him, and so you can unchoose. You can unchoose. Right? Um, uh, yeah, so many many people will believe that. But I, I think the way that a, a, the Calvinism would understand the warning passages and say, look, yeah, there there is a danger. There is a cliff. If you stop believing in Jesus and you persist in that, you won't be saved. Right? Um, 
However, the function of the warning passages is to stop that from happening to you. Right? So, yes, there's a real danger that the author's warning them of, but he actually doesn't think that they're going to fall away. You can see that at various points in the argument. Um, he, he actually thinks that they're going to persevere, right? And But the warning passages is part of the way that God in his sovereignty keeps us um, persevering or keeps us um, trusting in Jesus. So if we are truly one of his elect, right, um, then um, we will hear the warnings and we will, we will, we'll, we'll keep trusting in Jesus uh, to, to the end, right? And I think this is this is suggested in chapter three, verse six or so. Chapter three, verse six says, "We are His house if we hold fast our confession and our boasting in our hope." We are His house if indeed we hold fast our confession and our hope. That is, um, you ultimately you only know that someone is God's elect, God's people, if they persevere to the end. Because God's people will always persevere to the end. So if someone so-called falls away, well, they may have been a part of the church community, they may have participated in the church life in, in some sense, but um, either they weren't ever one of God's people um, or perhaps later on they're going to become one of God's people and they haven't yet, um, or they've, they've just been drifting and God's going to bring them back could also be that too. Um, but the idea is the true elect will always persevere to the end, and the warning passages is the way that he, 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 he perseveres. There. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, stop there, unless there's any more questions on Hebrews. Mm-hmm.